Welcome, Welcome. everyone. Welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a couple minutes. Thanks for being on time. And if you have any tech issues, just be sure to go ahead and send an email to vt at aarp.org. That's vt at aarp.org. All right, we'll give folks just one more minute and then we'll go ahead and kick off with our with our presenter. I don't remember what the other thing was, but the, the Neil who takes All right, Richard, are you ready? All right, great. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Kelly Stoddard Poor with AARP Vermont, and you are joining us for our annual placemaking workshop. This here is our optional session, which is the introduction to placemaking, placemaking 101, and we'll be covering uh, what placemaking is what it can achieve and how it's done, which is by people like you, testing and experimenting and reiterating to bring about community change. I'm joined here today with my colleague and friend, Richard Amore from the Department of Housing and Community Development. He has prepared a terrific presentation, which will be recorded and also available afterwards. Um, he'll be showcasing a number of real life examples in Vermont and beyond to inspire you in your work. We will wrap up the session about 9.53 so that we can transition um, for our kickoff at 10 o'clock. So there won't be much time for any Q&A, but Richard will be around so that you can chat with him um, in the chat, or he'll be off also offering a, a small group discussion tomorrow focused on crowd granting and a preview of the Better Places uh, program as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Richard. Good morning. Thanks, Kelly and AARP Vermont for leading these two days of discussing placemaking. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm thrilled to be here presenting with you all. So I'm Richard Amore, and I work at the Division for Community Planning and Revitalization for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. We provide communities resources, training, and tools to plan and build thriving places. I live in Montpelier with my family and I'm a professional planner and landscape architect and serve as the planning and outreach manager for our team and charged with leading the state's placemaking efforts through the Better Places program. Today, I'm gonna to share an overview of placemaking and why it matters, highlighting some Vermont examples and then share ways to help advance local placemaking efforts in your community. Our investments in place matter. Our places determine Vermonters' health, wealth, and happiness more than anything else. Building community pride and social capital and fostering attachment to place is key to community revitalization and rural economic development. Investing in public places creates more opportunities to bring people together and build welcoming communities, healthy places, and inclusive economies for all of us. Investments in downtowns and villages are important. It's place-based, people-focused community development. It's the places we live and it's investments in our economy, our civic life, and the places we call home. And before any marketing brochure, website, or ad campaign, the community's character, its streets and public spaces is the first and most important economic development message that a community can deliver on. In Vermont, our charming downtowns and villages are the foundation for creating great places. 
Vermonters are building vibrant communities with new sidewalks, new businesses, and new housing opportunities. It's place-based economic development that markets itself. Thriving places help define a community's economic vitality. From bike trails and pocket parks to vibrant villages and downtowns, Vermont's unique sense of place attracts and retains talent, brings in visitors, and improves the quality of life for residents that is unmatched throughout the country. And Bristol's placemaking efforts enliven the downtown, bringing people and energy to Main Street, creating a place where people want to gather and connect with one another to build community. Our historic downtowns and villages provide the foundation for great places now and then, as Burlington did in 1907, providing a place to go and engage in public life along Church Street. Vermonters have been activating our downtowns and villages for over 100 years with a parade in Wilmington in the early 1900s. Or in Montpelier, the community coming together to celebrate July 4th. None of these ideas are new. Vermonters have been doing placemaking for a long, long time. Even in the middle of winter, including an 1886 winter carnival in Burlington with its toboggan hill and gateway built on Main Street. Hot beef tea, anyone? Can you imagine Burlington's Main Street being a sledding hill today? Placemaking is not new. We've been doing this from the beginning of our settlement in Vermont and our humanity, from our village greens to our old home days, town commons, annual holiday traditions, and more. Community-led placemaking is a growing movement of do it ourselves village making, not much different than the village improvement societies in the past, where residents, business owners, and the municipality come together to breathe new life into villages through reimagining their public spaces and main streets. These are community-driven projects that leverage local assets and ideas to create places that truly reflect the community's needs, character, and identity. Place-making projects can be pocket parks, outdoor plaza, village events, public art, pop-up spaces, farmers markets, art centers, and so much more. These locally led projects provide a meaningful, incremental, grassroots approach to improving our communities through activation of and revitalizing our public spaces together. Placemaking projects invite greater interaction between Vermonters and foster healthier, more social and economically viable communities for all of us. But placemaking is not just the act of building or fixing up a public space. It's also the community-led process that builds connections, relationships, and fosters that attachment to place, building local pride, where people feel a strong stake in their community and a commitment to making things better. So why do we invest in placemaking? Communities that are investing in placemaking projects show that these small investments add excitement and energy to the community, improving local economies and building strong and socially resilient communities. It's all about really making connections. It's an investment in relationships, people, and the places we call home. Placemaking provides spaces where people exchange ideas and take action together at the local level, building strong relationships, empowering new leaders, and creating opportunity. These campaigns get results because people are energized by seeing improvements right away in their communities so they stay involved for the long haul. Place-making efforts bring residents together from diverse backgrounds, building community connections and social capital. Building social capital means not just bringing people together, but creating opportunities for them to do activities together to, to, to develop trusting relationships and shared experiences. These efforts spur business development and job growth in Vermont's downtowns and villages, like this pop-up vintage toy store in Bethel. These grassroots investments can also improve housing values, spark retail activity, increase tourism, and promote community safety. Placemaking efforts support place-based community-led economic development efforts that get all ages involved. It makes our places more walkable, bikeable, increasing physical activity, and improving public health. It celebrates the arts and taps into a community's creativity, stimulating the local creative economy and bringing art to the people. 
can increase access to fresh, healthy, and local food through markets, community gardens, local food pantries, and more. Placemaking efforts help communities test ideas with demonstration or pilot projects to test their feasibility or community acceptance prior to making a large capital investment. Placemaking efforts connect neighbors to one another, building strong neighborhoods and lasting relationships. These efforts build community connections, reducing social isolation and building social cohesion. And these connections are critically important to our personal well being and health, but also for building strong communities and ensuring strong social connections and community resilience during times of disaster where neighbors and friends help one another recover and bounce back stronger. Public spaces that are revived, connected, and open to all residents also counter isolation and mistrust and promote strong, stronger community engagement and attachment. When residents from different backgrounds come together, they share experiences. Why does this matter? Well, being around others, including those who don't look or act like us, breeds empathy and understanding, which is essential to building community, overcoming barriers, developing communal solutions, and equitably rebuilding our civic life, our economy, and our democracy. Placemaking provides connections to nature and builds greening projects that promote resilience, mitigate climate change impacts, absorb stormwater, and support public health. And public spaces and placemaking activities provide opportunities to peacefully protest, advance a cause, and support a healthy democracy. And they help us endure our long, dark, cold Vermont winters that are coming with a downtown sledding hill on Center Street in Rutland. Encourages playful interactions that build fun, collective memories and shared experiences together in public life. These placemaking projects, they're led by local volunteers who become engaged in their community, then volunteer on the planning commission, run for select board, buy and renovate, historic village buildings and become local leaders who make positive change happen in their community. And it embraces who we are as Vermonters, celebrating our connections and relationship to our neighbors, our communities, our culture and our place. These images are powerful, but it's more than just how pretty they look. These spaces are more welcoming, more vibrant and socially and economically connected. Residents and visitors are seeing these spaces and changing their perspective on what is possible. It's inspiring new leaders, businesses, and residents to invest their time and money in their communities. Placemaking is both a philosophy and an iterative collaborative process for creating public spaces that people love and feel connected to. And we need more social spaces in our communities where it's possible to make connections with other Vermonters, to discuss and exchange ideas face-to-face, -face, participate in civic life, and enjoy cultural events to celebrate and build collective memories. And you know it when you see it. It offers a welcoming and friendly place to hang your hat. Like in Waitsfield, where they rally together after the devastation from Tropical Storm Irene to build a small pocket park at the knuckle of the Mad River and the covered bridge in the heart of the village. And they celebrated the event with a party to smaller beautification improvements in Arlington or a beautiful entryway into a small business in downtown White River Junction to expressing your thanks in Brattleboro. to hosting a public art contest on the streets of Morrisville with colorful chairs, to offering books, food, personal items, and board games in Orwell Village, to creating a small park with lots of beautiful flowers in Wilmington, to making huge investments in public spaces like Burlington City Hall Park upgrade with new gardens, interactive fountain, green stormwater infrastructure, seating areas, and public art, to reclaiming parking spaces in downtown Montpelier to host a seasonal parklet that provides outdoor seating areas in the heart of downtown. Or in Rutland, where they transformed Center Street to support local businesses during the pandemic with outdoor dining, safer streets, and adding public art 
to the downtown. We often think of transportation in terms of mobility and access, but it can be so much more. As the pandemic has illustrated, our sidewalks have served as essential social and economic infrastructure to help our businesses expand their showrooms, restaurants expand their dining rooms, and for Vermonters to expand their living rooms to connect with one another in public life. Sidewalks are one of the first steps in building walkable, equitable, and welcoming communities. Or activating an alley in Barrie with public art, reflecting Barrie's long history and traditions to the granite industry with this granite zipper. To playing street checkers in Bethel. To playing the guitar on Halloween night in Montpelier. To activating vacant buildings with public art in Bellows Falls to colorful murals that help advance social justice and racial equity in Montpelier and Rutland, to activating a parking lot with pop-up food carts and outdoor seating in Brattleboro, or watching the World Cup at City Hall Park in Burlington, or playing with a band in Manchester, or bringing music and performers and food to downtown Montpelier or enjoying bluegrass and brunch and Braintree. As these local Vermont projects have shown, placemaking projects, they animate public and private spaces, rejuvenate structures and streetscapes, improve local business viability and public safety, and bring people together to celebrate, inspire, and be inspired. I'd like to share a quick example from over 40 years ago in Burlington, showing how small improvements can make enduring impact. Burlington's Church Street in the 1970s was bleak, a barren street with not much activity, filled with cars and not too many people. But today it's the center of commerce and social life in Burlington. It's the defining community space in the city. And it all started during the summer of 1979. A one day experimental street fair was held on four blocks of Church Street and approximately 15,000 people attended. The following year in 1972, a second week long street fair was held along Church Street. It was a test to see if merchants could live without parking directly in front of their stores, opening up the street for pedestrians and creating a shared public space. Merchants were allowed full use of the area to display their retail goods and special events were planned. It was estimated that over 50,000 people attended during the week. The success of the street fair was taken as a demonstration of the feasibility of the pedestrian mall. And it's been the center of public life and economic activity in Burlington since 1981. And it all started with an idea, a simple idea that they tested for a day, then a week, and then it gained momentum and transformed the city of Burlington. And each year, some 3 million visitors visit Church Street, shop, dine, and support Vermont's economy. Just as the residents of Burlington did in the 1970s on Church Street, placemaking is acts of doing something. It's not planning, it's doing. And that's what's so powerful about it. And placemaking projects are right sized for smaller rural communities as well, like in Bethel, where they transformed their village over one weekend into a pop-up festival with improved bike lanes, gathering areas, pop-up retail stores, a taco stand and beer garden, and added a community art project, making their village more vibrant, connected, safer for pedestrians and cyclists. And placemaking is better for business too. 2015 Bethel's downtown was tired. Historic buildings laid vacant, some for sale, many needing repair and businesses were struggling. But since Better Block Weekend in 2016, Bethel's historic buildings are now more occupied with new businesses. New owners have invested in some Main Street buildings. Property owners have made some repairs. A new pocket park was installed and the Blossom Block hosts ongoing retail pop-up events. As you've seen today, placemaking can improve local economies in both small towns and bigger cities. And we can't achieve true economic revival in our rural communities without bridging social divides and creating opportunities for more residents to come together and participate in community building and civic life. And that's what placemaking can do. These investments in place matter because people matter and our place determines people's health, wealth and happiness more than anything else.
We need to treat our public spaces and community gathering areas as essential infrastructure, not luxuries. And as we emerge from the pandemic and transition to the new normal, we have an opportunity to reflect on the changes brought by COVID, take more enduring steps to improve quality of life, local economies, and social capital in Vermont communities in more equitable and inclusive ways. It's about broadening that conversation to include residents, in meaningful engagement, and co-creation of their own community gathering areas and having that growth come from within the community. I wanna share some reflections from White River Junction this past summer. They hosted the White River Junction cinematic event series that activated a vacant parking lot in the heart of downtown. And a great quote from someone who visited the event this past summer, I'd driven by this parking lot hundreds of times and never ever noticed it was here. Now I'll never drive by it again without remembering this energy, this night, and placemaking can do that. It can add that energy and excitement to underutilized spaces in your community. I'd like to wrap up with sharing five tips or observations to creating better places through placemaking. I always thought someone should do something until one day, well, I realized I was that someone. So go out and make it happen. And we are here to help. The community is the expert and knows the place the best. The creativity and spirit of Vermonters and our communities are the greatest resource any place has. And you are the local heroes making positive change happen daily in your community. Place making is all about teamwork, collaboration, and doing great things together to build community in a fun and inclusive way. So go out and have fun together, making your community better. And it's like turning a house into a home. In inclusive and equitable public spaces, residents feel first that they are welcome, and second, that it is within their power to change those places through their own actions. Place banking is both an ethos and hands-on approach to improving places. It needs to be done with the community being involved. 50% is about temporary or permanent changes to create places people want to go to or be. And the other 50% is about the changes to people's thinking, building community pride and becoming more active and involved in your community. Effective placemaking is more like raising a child than designing a product. It requires ongoing love, attention, learning, and many little investments to succeed. In summary, placemaking is all about creating places where people love, that is people focused, inclusive and collaborative, flexible and adaptable, iterative, visionary yet practical, and it's community led, community created and community owned. As mentioned before, placemaking is all about doing things to improve social life and building community connections. But in case you make a mistake or get yourself in some good trouble, here's a get out of jail free card. To close, Vermont's success in fighting for equality, overcoming civic distrust, building inclusive economies, and preparing for future pandemics and climate change depends upon more trust, more empathy, more local empowerment, more civic participation, more communal problem solving, and more economic opportunity, not less. To face these challenges and opportunities, we need investments that provide more opportunities for all members of our community to engage in social life and economic prosperity. That's why I'm excited to share that the state is launching the Better Places crowd granting program in January to inspire local action, supporting small but meaningful improvements to downtown and village gathering areas that build community, celebrate local culture, and create better places for all of us. Through placemaking and the creativity and spirit of Vermonters, the opportunity lies ahead of us to make transformational change and lever the leverage the power of public spaces to build better and more equitable places that make us proud to live in our brave little state. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Richard. That was fantastic. And your, your slides certainly inspire all of us and make us so proud of where we live. Um, and I really do appreciate the get out of jail card <laughs> as well. <laughs> that was really creative. Um, we are going to transition to our, um, to our next panel of speakers so that we can kick off at our 10 o'clock. And I just want to um, Thank Richard again for his time. He he is a tremendous resource. He'll be around for the rest of the morning. So if you have any questions, feel free to privately chat him 
or tomorrow he will be um, he'll be at the optional session tomorrow as well, just showcasing some of the resources and tools that are available through the Department of Housing and Community Development, as well as running a small group discussion focused on crowd granting and a preview of the Better Places program. So Richard is available. And Richard, if you don't mind uh, just also uh, popping your email in the chat, that would be fantastic as well. So why don't we we're just you can take a stretch break, um, grab some more coffee, and we'll, we're going to uh, get our next panel of speakers up and running. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Annie, hi. Hey there. Um, I just want to just test your. Um, I'm going to take off my the spotlight real quick and just test your. Um, your sound sounds good. Could you just say a couple more words for me? No. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to see so many people joining us this morning. Welcome. I'm Kelly Stoddard Poor with AARP Vermont, and welcome to AARP's fourth annual placemaking workshop Inclusive Placemaking for Every Season. So, today is about connecting with one another and being inspired by others and the places we live and visit. Whether you are new to placemaking or have been creating and activating public spaces for years now, I hope that you learned something new today and have the opportunity to connect with someone you didn't know before today. Our goal for this workshop is for all of you to become better equipped in advancing the livability of your communities. <clears throat> through all seasons by creating public spaces to help build social capital. Placemaking at its core is about strengthening the connection between people and the places they share by reinventing, reengaging, and reimagining <clears throat> the way that public spaces are experienced. Public spaces have played an increasingly important role during the pandemic as a setting for socially distanced gatherings, which has ultimately resulted in their increased value as they provide social connection and improve our physical and our mental well being. But this isn't the case for everyone. Not everyone has access to safe, welcoming, and accessible spaces. So it's important that we approach our placemaking work through a lens of equity, 
and inclusion in order to create inviting and welcoming places for everyone, regardless of their age, ability, their race, gender, religion, or socioeconomic status. Ultimately, we want to be creating communities that work better for all. The most successful placemaking projects put people at the forefront of creating the change in their community. And on behalf of AARP and our mission to enhance the quality of life for all as we age, I want to thank our partners who have worked with us so closely in creating this workshop by helping us identify the topic areas, gaps, and opportunities for exploration. So it's with deep appreciation for our partnerships with the Vermont Arts Council, with the Department of Housing and Community Development, Community Workshop, Vermont Department of Health, VTrans, Local Motion, Preservation Trust of Vermont, and Vermont Council on Rural Development. This workshop is a reflection of all of our collective efforts to strengthen and build equitable, accessible, and resilient public spaces that will foster social, cultural, economic, and civic life. We've got a packed agenda for today. We've broken up uh, um, our workshop over two days. So our first day is going to is focused on inclusivity and equity, and day two is about the seasonality of placemaking. So day one today, where you're you're here today, so thank you and welcome for being here. It is all about building your strategy around placemaking, how to build a framework to support inclusive, access, accessible public spaces. Our presenters that we have today will provide you with an opportunity to think differently about the role of our public spaces and who they serve and how important it is to engage the community in the process. Day two is all about the importance of building inclusive public spaces year round. So even during our darkest and our coldest months of the year, this day two will be more tactical in nature with, by showcasing our new winter guide that we've developed with 880 cities and several examples from inspiring Vermont communities. Placemaking is for any community, big, small, medium, tiny. We have intentionally invited speakers to share examples from communities of all sizes. We also have some breakout sessions that are um, intended to really be able to provide you with an opportunity to dig deeper and have more meaningful, insightful discussions, um, and also provide you with a, an opportunity to connect with your peers and issue experts. So I ask all of you to be open to new ideas today, listen to others, and contribute your voice, whether that is in the chat or coming off of mute and sharing your voice there. So we've got, as I shared, we've got a packed agenda. Our first panel will be on equity and inclusion through partnerships. And then we'll go into our small, um, into our breakout sessions, ask me anything, which, with, which has different topic areas. So before um, I introduce our first panel, I want to do a waterfall chat. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have done this before, but I'm going to, I'm going to divide our group up into two groups. Okay. So the first group, if your last name begins with A through M, you're in group one. And group two, if your last name begins with N through Z. All right, so group one, last name A through M, group two, N through Z. And I want everybody to open up the chat, please. And I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to type your, I want you to type your response into the chat, but don't hit send yet, because we're going we're gonna to all send it at the same time. So open up your chat. And the first question I want, I'm going to ask you is, what is your favorite place in your community? You don't have to say why, but just what is your favorite place in your community? I'll give you all just a moment. And that's only for group one to respond to. And then I want, and don't hit send, don't hit send yet. Well, everybody's hitting send, so we'll go ahead and hit send now. <laughs> All right, and we'll see that waterfall chat happen. Um, now I want to ask everybody in group two with the last name of N through Z to look at the responses. And I want you all to open up, keep your chat open. And in the chat, and don't hit send yet because we'll, we'll do it on the count of three, what resonates with you the most and why? What do you see in that waterfall chat that resonates the most with you? What, what, what do you feel connected with the most? And then if you can type that in, and then I will ask everyone to go ahead and hit send again, and then we can hear, we can see those connections. 
community, shared spaces, love it. Open spaces, downtowns, love it. Wonderful. Oh, they're still coming through, I love it. Community, I love it. Thank you very much for participating in that. Um, and if you haven't done so yet already too, we, oh, well, libraries too, I just saw, big fan of libraries. They're such an important community asset in, in Vermont. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panel of presenters. Um, our first panel is on equity and inclusion through partnerships. We have three incredible presenters that are joining us this morning that are gonna be able to present the work that they're doing in their community. We know that our public spaces are important places for building a sense of community and social belonging. They're spaces that ultimately should belong to everyone. However, the way our public spaces and parks are often designed or maintained or programmed doesn't always reflect the purpose and promise of such unique public spaces. We will hear directly from our panelists on strategies to engage community in the process by having them part of the placemaking effort and how projects can reflect the diversity of voices within our community. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and pull up our invite, Annie. Annie Bourdon is uh, from Oak Ledge for All, and Annie will be, a, be addressing accessible and welcoming public spaces. We will be able, we're gonna go through all three of our panelists. We're gonna have Q and A after all three panelists are done presenting. And after Annie, we'll hear from Will Casso Condry from Juniper Creative Arts, and then we'll hear from Samantha Davidson Green from White River Indie Films. But I'm gonna go ahead and invite Annie to come off of mute. And we're gonna go ahead and pull up your screens. Good morning, Annie. Welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm Annie Borden. I'm a volunteer with Oak Ledge for All and we can go to the next slide. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. I live in Burlington um, with my husband and eight-year-old twins, Otis and Posey, who are pictured here. Um, my son Otis has multiple disabilities. He has cerebral palsy and he is um, unable to walk independently or sit independently. He um, can do many magnificent things, but he needs help with most things, um, including getting around. Um, I got involved with Oak Ledge for All before it was actually called Oak Ledge for All um, back in 2016, shortly after Burlington Parks and Rec um, started to launch a public engagement process in designing um, what will, would become Oak Ledge for All. And I got involved because at that time, my twins were three and we realized that there were no accessible, inclusive playgrounds or really kind of um, meaningfully ADA compliant playgrounds in all of Burlington or as we went around nearby towns. Um, and then I learned they're really not in the entire state. And it was around that time that Otis was too big to be squeezed into the little infant toddler swings that were available at most playgrounds. And it was this aha moment that was pretty devastating for a family that the playground was no longer a place that brought joy to our kids. Um, and I'm also the director of a local nonprofit when I'm not taking care of my kids and, uh, and volunteering. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, so Oak Ledge for All is a volunteer initiative to build Vermont's first universally accessible playground because we fundamentally believe that everyone deserves to play. Our mission is to foster inclusion and strengthen our community by improving the accessibility of our region's playgrounds and parks so they are welcoming and fun for everyone who wants to enjoy them. This is a, um, a mock-up of, of one of the design plans for Oak Ledge for All. It, it is not exactly how Oak Ledge for All will, will come to be uh, next year, but it, it creates, I think, a, a nice vision of what we had in mind and how the playground could be used. And it's more than just as playground, as you as you can see, it's an area for gathering. It's an area to take a break and rest. Um, it's an area to enjoy the lake and nature, and um, so it's going to be awesome. And while we have a, a goal of strengthening other community playgrounds, Oak Ledge is really our our focus now. We'll see what we're able to do next. Next slide, please. So the need, as I mentioned, um, there are no accessible 
playgrounds, despite Vermont's wealth of outdoor activities, recreational centers, um, outdoor areas, if you have any sort of mobility, visual, sensory, or other challenges, um, it would be really difficult to enjoy some of those opportunities. And what is coming next is a little video of my kids' uh, testimonial that they put together a year ago when they were seven, um, and it's during the holiday season, so I apologize, messy house in the background. <laughs> Rebecca, we're not getting the sound. Sound is still not coming through. Okay, I've adjusted it. Um, I think, let's see, let's just try it again. Sounds all the way up. Still no sound. And I have still no sound. We got it now. Maybe we could start from the beginning. I'm seven. I what is I three. I what is I am seven years old and I have CP. I'm Posey and I'm seven years old too. And to me, someone to have CP, it means that you need help moving and walking and you, need, you might need a wheelchair. Why is Oak Ledge for All important to you two? Because um, whenever we go to a playground, Otis can't play with me, and I like playing with him, so I want, I want a playground for everybody who has CP so they can play A2. Yeah, CP and other, and other disabilities, right? Yeah. Otis, what do you like about Oak Ledge for All? What are you excited about? I like, I like using the wheelchair. You like using the a wheelchair? When you use a wheelchair, what do you like to do at the playground? Move a wheelchair. Yeah. What are your favorite things? Do you like to swing? Singing on the feet is different. Yeah. Do you wish that, what else would you like to do at the playground? I wish that I could do something. Like what? Cozy, what do you like to do? What? I like to swim in the lake, but Otis can't really do that. So that's why I really want the beach to be accessible. Otis, do you like to swim? Yeah. Yeah. Do you like to go on the slide? Uh-huh. Yeah. Do you like to bounce around on things? Uh-huh. Yeah. Are you super excited for Oak Ledge for All? Yeah. Yeah. What else do you want to say? That I'm... <laughs> Great. We can go on to the next slide. So here's a little bit of history. So. I got involved um, well after Oak Ledge for All had, had begun. And it was started by my friend and, and co-volunteer, Julia Wayne, when she was a graduate student at UVM getting a degree in special education, um, in early, early ed special education. And she was doing a fellowship and appreciated that um, there were no playgrounds where she could bring the students that she was 
teaching or and was going to continue to teach and she was looking for opportunities to take them outdoors and was just shocked by this realization and so um, she made that kind of the basis of a research project um, and then she in 2013 after she graduated she brought a concept to Burlington Parks and Rec and asked them if they would consider creating this playground as as a large city that could serve the entire region she discovered that there were no accessible, intentionally accessible playgrounds, not only in all of Vermont, but in the entire region. So upstate New York, um, New Hampshire, uh, even, even um, parts of Canada. So in 2013, um, BPRW uh, was willing to at least do a siting study to see if any um, of their existing playgrounds were ripe for transformation, if this could be a possibility. And that took a little bit of time, but in 2015, they declared that Oak Ledge Park um, would be perfect because of its um, central location um, on, you know, near the lake, um, along the bike path, and that it had a really deteriorate, deteriorated play structure that was ready to be um, re renewed and refreshed anyway. So they um, committed to funding the design of the playground and hired some great consultants out of Boston, but they were not yet committed to paying for its actual construction. Um, and they also were really committed to um, initiating a public eng engagement process to invite community members to help create um, this new playground. And that's when I got involved. I happened to hear about a community um, meeting and I, um, eagerly showed up with my kids. It was down the street at the elementary school that my children actually go to. And sadly, I couldn't bring Otis in because it was um, up a flight of stairs. So that was kind of an aha moment lesson one of, of how to in include folks who um, whose voice you want to um, hear, but kind of meeting them where they are. Um, and that changed. And, and after that meeting, I, I quickly got involved. And in and then my primary role has been um, doing fundraising and outreach and education about this and, and really trying to hold the city um, accountable and make them um, a stronger partner, which they truly are. And they've BPRW and the city has really stepped up here. Um, in 2018, BPRW installed a new swing area, which some of you might be familiar with it at Oak Ledge. And that is just a demonstration of what's to come. It was just kind of a they got a small grant and wanted to put it to use immediately to showcase what inclusive play structures and playgrounds can look like. And so OFA, you know, throughout this has really been um, the, the voice, I think, uh, advocating and bringing more, um, more opinions and ideas and um, experiences to the table for the city to hear. Next slide, please. There we go. So we, um, Oak Ledge for All designed for and by the community. So um, outside of those public meetings that the um, city organized, our volunteers met one on one with dozens of people. Um, primarily, Julia did this on top of now being a mom of three young kids and working full time. Um, we met one on one with adults with disabilities, with parents and caregivers of children with disabilities, with all sorts of educators, educators of all ages, um, disability rights advocates. Um, professionals like occupational therapists, vision, par vision therapists, um, physical therapists, uh, doctors, um, and community members, anyone who would want to enjoy this playground. Um, we almost immediately had raised, we had a seed grant that Julia had raised even before I got involved, and um, we put that to use, creating a name and um, and brand for Oak Ledge for All. So we've developed a website and a logo and uh, print materials and pins. Um, we had volunteers knitting rainbow colored hats that were spreading the word and pins that said, ask me about Oak Ledge. Um, and we went on to raise $150,000 towards the construction of the playground. But the design came in at a cost at well over a million dollars initially. And um, at that time, the city was still not yet committed to, to funding the entirety of the playground. They wanted our, our volunteer group to try and raise that. And we made it pretty clear that um, that, that wasn't possible. We, we weren't going to be able to raise a million dollars um, on our own. And more importantly, we wanted them to step up and, and make more of an investment. And, um, and they agreed. Um, and so uh, they prioritized Oak Ledge for All. In addition to, to committing more funds, they prioritized Oak Ledge for All for a significant state grant that they applied for 
um, earlier this year and we were, were awarded the funds and we'll be able to start construction in 2022, fingers crossed. So our vision, here are kind of the, the key features um, of Oak Ledge for All, which is based on universal, universally accessible design. So everyone has equal opportunity to participate in all aspects of the playground. There's no segregation. There isn't a kind of area with um, accessible equipment and an area with not. The, the intent is that anyone can enjoy everything um, if, if they choose. It will offer a range of play, sensory and nature-based experiences. There will be accessible connections to existing paths, so it won't be an island. You'll be able to access the playground from other areas once you're at Oak Ledge Park. There will be um, accessible restrooms, including an adult changing area. And this was really important that if you are not a toddler that can fit on a, on a little small changing table, you need a place to also have your bathroom needs met with, with dignity and with privacy and not have to do it on, you know, on the, in the grass, which is commonly what my family has had to do. Um, There'll be a variety of seating and gathering options, and um, they've a big improvement, and this is already underway if you've been to Oak Ledge, they've made the beach access at Blanchard Beach will be fully accessible from, for wheelchair users or any, any, any sort of mobility challenge, um, which is pretty awesome. Next slide, please. So Oak Ledge for All will be different because we went through the process of really engaging and listening to um, diverse people's perspectives. And that is really reflected in the design. And it has been a very, very long process. Um, but OFA, the VPRW has really looked at OFA to be their, its guiding light. And so at every stop when we've had to, as we, as we recently did, when we realized that the original $1.2 million design was more than we could afford to collectively build, we went back to the designers and said, okay, can you give us a, a different version that maybe has, has less structured, less features? And they, um, they were willing to do that. And we went through in, very, in a very considered way, identified priorities and we solicited feedback. You know, if we have to cut something, what should it be? And how are we, how are we still keeping something for everybody? Um, and that is really reflective in the design. Um, and, I think the commitment to inclusivity extends beyond the playground. As I mentioned, you know, having restrooms, having places to sit, being able to access the playground is, is really vital. And pictured here is my son Otis. We went to an, another playground in the community that opened earlier this year. Everyone told us it's great. It's an accessible new playground. And we went and my, my mind was kind of blown because I think it was really well-intentioned to create a, an, an inclusive playground. But um, as you see, there was a, a kind of barrier to hold in mulch surrounding it, um, except for this, except for two access points. The one access point that is visioned uh, that you can see here um, gives you access to a massive play structure, but once on the structure, there's very little that um, that one can actually do to, to play. And, um, you know, I think I identified, I counted maybe nine swings and only one of them was a universally accessible swing, which anybody can use. You don't need to have a disability to use that swing. I, you know. We're competing for the, the swings at, um, at Oak Ledge. So I think that this was a really probably well-intentioned um, design and probably was an inexpensive investment. Um, but I, I, I'd question if there was a thoughtful process of really talking to, to users about um, how they could better enjoy the playground. Next. So who benefits everyone? Um, Oak Ledge for all is, is, uh, is a place where we want everyone to feel welcome. We want um, you know, grandparents that may have some mobility issues to be able to safely enjoy spending time with their grandkids. We want adults who may have disabilities to have a place where they can play with their, with their kids. Pictured here is another one of my co-volunteers, Nate, who welcomed his, his first um, child last year, which was really exciting. And he was able to wheelchair up on this, one of the play structures at Oak Ledge for All. And, and this is the type of design, um, these are the types of, of, of things that you'll find at Oak Ledge for All. And not all of them are kind of off the shelf ordered from a, from a catalog. We're actually going to have to hire people to create our vision. Um, there's going to be a wide slide built into a hill that you can, um, that is at a slope that somebody could wheel themselves up or you could push a stroller or a wheelchair up and it'll be wide enough that a, a parent could slide down with their child safely. Um, 
or a group of kids or an entire family. So it's kind of those creative concepts um, that I'd love to see, um, you know, more playgrounds follow our lead. And we've certainly followed the examples of others. And um, it'll be it'll be exciting. We're told that and there's a lot of delays with construction materials and pricing has gone up on everything in the past um, 18 months, but we should have a brand new playground during next year's construction season. And, and that's all I have, but thank you. Um, the next slide has our website and I encourage you to, to check out, um, there's more information there and I'm happy to answer questions or are we holding on that? Thank you. Well, first, thank you, Annie. I just want to say thank you so much for, for what a terrific presentation and the inspiration. And your kids are inspiring. And I love that you're raising two little advocates. It's wonderful. Um, and lots of lessons to be learned. Um, we will hold off on questions. We're going to do Q&A after all the panelists. Um, but Annie, if you wouldn't mind uh, popping your email in the chat, that would be great. Some people would like to reach out to you directly. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, and I'm going to introduce Will Casso Condry from Juniper Creative Arts. Welcome, Will. Hi, Will. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Doing all right. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Will is going to present on cultural understanding and identity through public art. We're going to go ahead and pull up your slides for you, and just mm -hmm. want to remind folks that you can uh, put your questions in the chat. I'm taking notes there and um, we'll go ahead and um, we'll be able to get to your questions after our last panelist who will be Samantha, who will be presenting after Will. All right, Will, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, how y'all doing? I'm, excuse my voice, I'm still a little tired. It's been a long week. Um, will Castle Condre, co-founder of Juniper Creative Arts. Um, Juniper Creative Arts is a family collective along with my wife and my daughters. And we primarily produce community murals um, and that involve an array of different materials and subject matters um, centering around BIPOC individuals. So this mural here is on um, the one community center in the old North End in Burlington. And it's called Moringa the Medicine Woman. Uh, so we can proceed with the next slide. Uh, so what makes this project unique? Well, to first start, the wings of Moringa is comprised of 188 pieces of art painted by the community from elementary school students in the Old North End and also community, community members that came out to the annual ramble at the end of July of this, this past summer. Um, this project was funded by um, community contributions by the Champlain Housing Trust and also Vermont Community Foundation, Spark Grants, uh, et cetera, and also crowdsourcing, and also some local businesses, um, Sol Simone, uh, First Grants Coffee, and also uh, Juniper Creative ourselves. We produced some t-shirts um, for the Juneteenth celebration that proceeds for those uh, sales also went towards funding this project. It was a year, literally a year in the making. And the model reference, as you see here, is Mercedes Mack. She was born and raised in the Old North End. She's a DJ herbalist and just an all around good person. The cool thing about Mercedes is that I've known her for uh, some years now, but then she recently moved to um, Atlanta then came back. But during that time she was gone as we were putting this project together, just you know, getting some stories about her. Literally everyone who has something to say about Mercedes was nothing but positive things. You know, literally like she was like a beacon for her neighborhood. So it, it felt only right to have her represent this image of Moringa. Um, next slide. Oh, okay. So what this is this is a, a cool part. So what make this project unique? So Moringa, along with the images you see here, are part of a series that we created called the Afro Pollinators. And what that means is that the first the first image you see, the top left, that was one of the first murals we produced in the Afro, the actually the first mural we produced in the Afro Pollinator series called Kalis the Afronaut. Kalis is based off the image of my daughter Alexa Herrera Condre, who's also a part of Juniper Creative. And the interesting story about this mural is currently on the side of Champlain Elementary School, but originally it was supposed to be a part of a wall that was that was part of a living wall that was only that was scheduled to rotate every year. But we had to get permission from the building owner and the building owner saw the image and said that the image of a young black woman didn't represent the Burlington community. 
which triggered a response from the community at large. And we started raising funds to pr produce this image somewhere else. And Champlain Elementary School um, presented itself as the ideal lo location. The wings of Calise, again, is comprised of, I believe, 300 pieces of art produced by elementary school students. Um, the one to the top right is a mural we just recently produced in Winooski. Um, and again, features uh, children, they're both actually uh, the two children flanking on the left and right are my daughters, Alexa and Sierra. And the one in the middle is a child image of my wife. Again, same idea, the, the wings are produced from community art, um, from a community payday. This was also a collaboration with a local artist by the name of Mary Lacey. And then the one at the bottom, Liberation Through Imagination. This one is literally just recently complete. We have the unveiling uh, later this afternoon for it. It's on 339 Pine Street. It's called Liberation Through Imagination. Again, continuing the Afro Pollinator series and all the, the, the three uh, figures that you see up front are all local um, youth who live in the neighborhood and go to, uh, I believe, Champlain Elementary and also Burlington High School. So next slide. Uh, so this is again, the Moringa mural. This was um, early and this is probably maybe a few days into the actual process. And if, you know, the thing about what we do in Juniper Creative is that we tell BIPOC stories, you know, um, BIPOC individuals in this community are smaller number, but big in influence. So we like to highlight that, especially people who live here and have unique experiences within um, just the state at large. Not most, even though most of our work in Burlington, we do work throughout the entire state. And you know, the people who help bring these projects together literally are all part of the community. All different classes of folk, different race classes and genders. Everyone comes together to literally give these these characters flight. And and as you can see at the top on the top right is um, some of the community artwork when it was just being installed. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, so um, we, we facilitated primarily with Moringa um, art making workshops with fourth and fifth graders at Sustainability Academy and Integrated Arts Academy during the spring of 2021. Then during a the ramble this past summer, we opened it up to the larger community at large where majority of the artwork was created, um, 188 again in total. So all the pieces you see here were created um, during the ramble celebration by community members. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is, another, this is another shot from the ramble this past summer. So you see we have tables set up, um, paint brushes, paint and Depending on uh, the project, we have a typical uh, limited palette so that we can keep everything cohesive. And yeah, everybody have a good time. So this was, oh, sorry, you jumped ahead a little bit, but yeah. But anyway, you can see Alexa here installing the art and yeah, just people having a good time making art and it feels good. We always say, if you're, if you're not having fun making art, then you're doing it wrong, you know? And, um, when you when it's when it comes you could go to the next slide so you see here alexa um installing the community artwork uh we use a material called nova gel and all the community artwork is painted on a material called parachute cloth which is designed specifically to install in public art and it can last longer than a building properly installed so each each panel, each wing, you know, depending on the scale can take a few hours to install. So it's a pretty tedious process. And then you see me up here um, doing some finishing touches, but, and, and we have a mosaic style so that we tie all the artwork, the community artwork in the mosaic, mosaic pattern, which brings more attention to the artwork. So when people go by, they see these huge mosaic patterns, which actually draws them in. And we always like to say the community is literally what gives these characters flight. Yeah. And yeah, and you know, that's that's the last slide. I know I only had a, a few minutes, but um, but we like to give ownership to the community for these creations. Once we leave, the community owns it. So we love to have everyone involved in the, the process of creating because the one thing that we've noticed is that typically a lot of people don't see projects come together in this sort of fashion. So when they're involved in it, the the respect and the integrity of it is maintained and people take tend to take care of it longer 
and you know and have a good time with it and get to see it for years to come excellent thank you will i love i love what you said not you're not having fun creating art then you're doing it wrong um yeah <laughs> it's so true so true thank you so much uh, the images are just gorgeous and having the chance to have seen some of the artwork up front in real life is just it's inspiring and beautiful and i love how the community is so involved in the process um i know we'll have a, a, a richer discussion later on about that process as well uh, um and just want to thank you again for your time and for being here today and sharing with us. And I'm going to invite our next panelist, Samantha Davidson Green from White River Indie Films. And she's going to share about some of the work that they've been doing in White River over the summer and also in response to COVID as well. Um, some really wonderful, wonderful things happening in White River Junction. So welcome, Samantha. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Okay, great. Um, first of all, just Annie and Will, I thank you so much. Really, really inspired by your work and honored to be included in this presentation. Um, we had uh, an interesting year last year at White River Indie Films. We were just about to launch our 2020 festival when the pandemic um, locked us down and we um, began a process of trying to reimagine how we could use our art form to maintain and strengthen social connections in our community um, through 2020, mostly virtually. Um, and we reinvented film festival um, events for the virtual space. But by the end of the year, we really felt that we needed to, um, as I would say, liberate the light from our screens and liberate ourselves from the screen. So if we could advance to the next screen, um, we piloted, a uh, an experiment of projecting cinema on buildings and snowbanks in uh, White River Junction. I um, connected with a number of local film and media artists featured here: Everest Crawford and Quinn Thomas Show, um, and behind them Rich Fedorchak. And uh, we jumped on board to create a, a pilot over the winter solstice weekend, um, inviting local filmmakers to share their work, which we created loops of um, to project in various places. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. We were so inspired by the way this gave a socially distanced, safe way for people to actually interact in 3D. It was very cold. We Nature provided a beautiful snowstorm the night before, um, but there was just such a sense of joy. Um, and we felt that um, we had tapped an idea that we could develop. And entering 2021 with uncertainty about what would be possible from a public health perspective, um, we imagined ways that we could maintain this outdoor interaction and um, repurpose public spaces to um, create uh, safe environments. Um, in White River Junction, which is a historic downtown, there are um, wonderful sidewalk spaces, but our parks are somewhat separate. Um, our, our biggest park is across the river and over a bridge. So um, the the anchor of this idea was to take an old parking lot and we can go ahead, you see it a little bit here in this winter experiment. Um, and we'll go one one more slide after that, after the, sorry, advance again, please. Yeah, here we go. Um, so we, I learned about the Better Places grant and it just was an incredible alignment with what we were hoping um, to create, which was to basically take this parking lot and turn it into a big open uh, cinema space that could be um, adaptable for local artists to um, be inspired and jump in. And um, so we ended up uh, working with musicians, um, cart the cartoon study school, et cetera. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but over here, you have our, our vision um, to revitalize a practice that had, had kind of um, it had been well established and then had dropped off even before the pandemic of having first Friday night celebrations in downtown White River Junction. And it's always had a decentralized leadership structure um, where, where there was local music, galleries would stay open, yeah. restaurants. Um, but we had noticed that um, there had been drop off and that this new implementation of, of cinema and what we're calling expanded cinema would give an opportunity for people to rediscover this. And um, so if you could go to our next slide. 
you begin to see here how we took the parking lot and um, conceived of having projections in multiple directions. Um, we had um, not pictured here, but on the other side of all these buildings, we also had images uh, in shop windows to create a kind of circuit for people who could meander around the village. Um, we had, and you'll see in the video in just a moment, musicians who played in different parts, but this was kind of like a main stage area where people could bring um, takeout food and um, socialize in a socially distant uh, way. It evolved over the course of a four month period where we had um, subsequent opportunities to build upon the attendance and get the word out. Um, I want to highlight here the hands-on community filmmaking project. Sorry, it's right underneath this uh, control box there. Um, but we, I, I don't have an image of this, but we had uh, a handmade cinema activity where kids or people of any age, but kids were really drawn to it, could draw on celluloid. And then month by month, we would project the film that was created by people when they had come the previous month. So we had, you know, uh, community art projects that were meant to sort of entice people back. Um, but we'll go ahead to the next slide. The partnerships were really key. Um, we on a modest budget, we're able to produce four um, really robust evenings of programming. Um, Riff was provided the leadership and Everest and Quinn were the project producers and really brought artistic um, curation vision to the project. The town of Hartford was key. Um, the Hotel Coolidge provided the parking lot space and support. Um, Vital Communities, which has a, a local first commitment. Um, then I presently also now work with Community Access Television, the Hartford Chamber of Commerce, Center for Cartoon Studies, and many local businesses, but I'd like to highlight uh, Revolution and Landscapes and Scavenger as um, key businesses who provided help with uh, window space, promotion and publicity, uh, content, et cetera. So from the beginning, it had um, a, a lot of partners to uh, make points of connection for, for people to attend or contribute their artwork. Um, let's go to the next slide. So at every stage, um, Quinn and Everest just designed community art into it. So we had month by month opportunities for people to come out and paint a chair. Um, and we just figured that would also be a way for um, people to come back and, and you know have fun kind of scouting out their, their particular contribution to it. Um, they were really inventive about reaching out to local suppliers. They found an artist who created these little lanterns that were solar powered. Um, they worked with a graphic designer to create a unique uh, poster that was uh, hand silk screened in a print shop in White River Junction and then sold as a fundraiser at the events. Um, they're really a you know, piece of fine art themselves. Um, but one com important component of it was we were really trying to balance in the budget um, strategic infrastructure that was adaptable. So chairs, tables, projectors that could be used for pop-up cinema events in this space or others, but that we also had a high value on um, compensating the artists who were contributing their film work, their music, um, because so many artists were hit so hard and were really trying to um, support the creative community and creative economy here in a sustainable way. Could we go to the next slide, please? Sorry, Samantha, I think, are you seeing my, I'm advancing it? Oh, you know, um, yeah. Oh, there's the video. Yeah, so we'll just pause for a moment to have a little montage glimpse here, if it will play, hopefully with sound, but if not, at least you'll get the visual. Is it not wanting to play? So Rebecca, we're getting sound, but it's not advancing. Like the the video is not actually. We're getting the sound. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rebuffer it and start okay. it over again. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. 
Are you seeing it? Are going to share with you a program today. You know, the, uh, the visuals are not advancing, but I'll tell you what, I've got another video. So let's see if the next one plays. So this at least gave you a little bit of the sound and you can see a picture of the setup. So this was May when people were still masked and feeling very distant. So if we could go to the next slide, just want to speak to how... Um, there was a, a vision in um, Everson and Quinn's programming to have each month explore a different dimension of, of the arts and identity. And the June, um, the second one was very special in that. So we'll go to slide 10, please. Thanks. Um, June provided us an opportunity to honor, um, sorry, back to slide 10, please. Thanks. Um, to honor the one of the originators of this tradition of the Friday night um, first Friday celebrations. Uh, Dave Clark had been a musician who passed away during the pandemic from cancer, but was much beloved. So this one was uh, a partnership with Rob Oxford and many musicians in the area. Also had a film element, but we started our program with a variety of different groups. And as you can see, as the weather opened up and we were um, had more vaccinations, people were able to gather and um, be a little bit more free. Um, if the next video will work, it will give you a sense of the whole energy that started to generate in the village on this second night. Uh, so if we go to 11, let's see if this one will work. I am afraid that these videos are glitching. Um, okay. What we can do is put the Google Drive links um, sure. Share with everyone in the chat, and then we can recreate the experience. Sorry about that, folks. No worries. Okay, um, so let's uh, jump to slide 12. This is <laughs> also um, a, uh, a, a video one, but I, I can share the whole presentation then if people would like to click through the videos um, and enjoy them later. So July, um, we uh, shifted to the theme of out of yourself and invited some artists from other parts of the state. So this was really an exciting one because it combined experimental film with live performance. We ended up needing to move inside for this because it was pouring rain. Um, but by that point, we had in working with the Briggs Opera House and public health standards supported it. We were able to um, to move the show inside and it involved some burlesque um, and uh, was really just this incredible um, integration of local artists, regional artists, um, performance and music and cinema. And finally in uh, slide 13, we, for our culminating event um, in August, we premiered Jay Craven's uh, feature version of Martin Eden. Um, and although this shows it outdoors, this too had to move inside for various reasons, but we maintained all of the outdoor projections in the windows and music as well. Um, what we noticed over the course month by month was that the word got out and people were, were returning and um, a lot of independent artists were getting in on it. And um, we have some galleries that in the area that um, joined back in. And I think what we've seen in the wake of our effort is that First Fridays really came back to life. I mean, of course, we're going back into the cold months. And I think one of the themes of this conference is about um, the all season aspect of this. And we, we do have indoor options. We're just kind of following the public health um, guidance. Um, and there are street level, the street level aspect of this was very important to us from an accessibility level. And there are some creative spaces. Uh, David Briggs has been um, very helpful in repurposing an area called the Newberry Market, which is an open space between two restaurants at ground level. Um, we wanted, the intergenerational aspect was very important because one of the things we realized was that the First Friday tradition had been led by people in a sort of, I would call them 40 to 60 age bracket right now. Um, and that we needed to kind of make space for new younger artists to have authorship in creating these events. So I think having our creative team be led by um, some local media artists in their 20s, um, but we also have new assisted living facilities in White River Junction. And um, at, in my role at CATV, we're working with the Bugby Senior Center. We're really thinking about the whole lifespan and what it is to have um, 
uh, arts events that have content and uh, accessible interaction um, formats so that uh, everybody feels a part of, of one community. And um, so I just wanna thank you all for the chance to share about this and to thank Richard and the Better Places grant because this um, was really a, a tremendously fulfilling experience for us. Thank you. Thank and you, have, Samantha. Um, that, that was wonderful. I really appreciate you being so patient and flexible during some of the glitches with the PowerPoint. And I apologize that we weren't able to show the videos, but we'll get the links out to folks. Um, they could check out those videos um, on YouTube. And then we'll also be sharing um, and rec we're obviously recording the, the workshop and then can share out um, uh, the videos afterwards as well. And I just want to thank you for your creativity and bringing some really great examples to, to everybody. And also the focus on multi-generational is so important, obviously from AARP's perspective, um, so that we can see people and have people engaged across the age spectrum is so important. Um, so I want to invite folks to either um, open up the chat and put a question in there. We've got a few minutes for, for some Q&A. Um, after, after this panel pres uh, presentation, we will be going into some breakout sessions, which you'll be able to dig deeper with our panelists on different topic areas. Um, but if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. Or if you would like to ask your question, um, please go ahead and open at the bottom of your um, of the screen, go up into reactions and then use the raise hand signal. And I will just scroll through just to see if we've got anybody um, with their hands raised with a question. But one question that did come in through the chat that I want to ask, and this, this was directed to Annie, but I think it, anybody could answer this, but we'll start with Annie first. Um, the, there was a broad range of interviews during the process for the for Oak Ledge for All, and were all the groups there at the very beginning, Annie, that you engaged with, or did you discover new groups along the way as you were doing your outreach? Great question. Um, we discovered a lot more people. Along Annie, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. It's really soft. Your voice is coming in really soft. Let's try that again. Can you hear me now? Is it maybe it's is it just me or is everybody having a, is Annie's voice it's a soft on their end? It sounds soft. Better now. Oh, go ahead, try again. Can you hear me now? Still very soft. All right. Well, why don't we why don't we pose that um, question to the other two panelists, and we can circle back with Annie. But uh, Will, why don't we go with you? So when you're when you're when you're engaging with the community, um, do you what does the process look like as far as are new groups coming in throughout the process? Is the group that you're working with at the very beginning? Love to hear your thoughts. Well, it depends. So typically when we're doing um, youth-based community work, we're working with the schools. So we're going into the classrooms, you know, um, giving the students the template with the paint. But when we do it with the broader community, it's literally whoever comes up, you know, so we have a table or a table set up with the supplies out. And it's basically like come one, come all, you know, so we don't we like to make opportunities for everyone to have a hand in it. And you meet an array of people, you know, you meet people who are like super enthusiastic, you meet people who come up with their children because they just saw us out there, you know, they didn't plan on it. And, you know, but sometimes, you know, you, you meet some people who aren't bringing the most positive energy as well. It's, it could be a mixed bag. So I tell people all the time is that when you're doing this type of public work, especially being a person of color, you have to be very careful because you never really know what you're going to get. But as long as you're leading with a positive energy, you're typically going to get that back. And nine times out of 10, most of our interactions with the public when we do projects like this are positive. And but the cool thing about it, again, it's just the people you meet, especially, you know, the kids come up and I don't I don't know, maybe it's something about a Vermont youth, but they literally come up and start hugging the walls, you know, and I've never seen that before until I came here. So and that's beautiful. I mean, especially with um, young folk, with young kids, you know, they see the colors, they see the brightness, they see all the movement in these works and they're attracted to that and they're just enthusiastic to do something. And the beautiful thing about when kids make art they go into it with no pretension, you know? So it's not like they're like, hmm, I gotta think about it. Some do, 
but most just go right at it. They see the colors, they, they, they make multiple pieces and majority of those pieces get installed. And then they come up and see their work in the mural. It just adds a whole new dimension to it. And the cool thing about it, the way we install these projects is that they're gonna be up for years. You know, Properly installed, these murals can last 10, 15 years. So these, these young people will literally grow with the work you know, and then know that they had a hand in creating it, it just adds more of a sense of pride around it. So typically with issues of vandalism and things of that nature are very, very low, you know, because there's so much community investment. Everybody has a piece. It's, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. That's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I love, I love that about the kids. <laughs> no hesitation. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Samantha, why don't we go to you and ask, um, so during, during the outreach process um, in Wright River, how did your engagement evolve over time and did it look differently from the beginning, from the middle to the end? Well, one of the things that we uh, did in the very early stages, um, even while we were writing uh, our grant proposal and envisioning it was to hold several brown bag lunches via Zoom in January. And that was uh, something we publicized through um, the town of Hartford and, and uh, an email list in the community of local businesses and arts groups. We didn't have a huge turnout, to be honest, um, but we had some very engaged turnout. And so um, they were people who were definitely uh, interested in um, and brought a lot of great ideas, not all of which we could implement. <laughs> Um, there, you know, it was meant to be like throw throw the the doors wide open and then see what we could do with our budget. And um, but uh, what evolved over time was, it, you know, as the winter went on and we were planning like the, with the music groups, um, we connected with Rob, Rob Oxford, who had a strong network, as I mentioned from our June show, and um, he put outreach out to musicians. And then there was just like a flood of people who wanted to come. And it was sort of like, because of the June event that helped them be aware of the May event that was coming before that. So there were people who just kind of came in different capacities. Like sometimes they were just coming as audience. Um, sometimes they were coming as performers. There was a sort of fluidity. Um, we wanted to maximize the number of opportunities for artists to share their art form. Um, the, um, the family participation was really interesting too, because um, there were several children who participated as musicians, and then we had this hands-on art activity. So we saw that there were several people who came back and then would bring their friends, um, which uh, was just what, what we hoped for. Um, and by July, um, and this was an intentional design, Everest and Quinn, um, in designing the, the burlesque show, reached out to, you know, statewide to performers who, who came down. So that was just like this sort of evolution outward to, to other parts of the state, drawing them to our community. Um, and that was a really exciting development. We had some of some of the drag performers said, we've never been to White River. This is a pretty great place. And, you know, that was what we wanted. We wanted to put our, our village on the map as a creative destination. Um, and, you know, one thing I wanna say is in the ripple effect, I in this time, I took a new job here at CATV. CATV was one of the partners beforehand. So now I'm kind of wearing, have a foot in each realm and I'm kind of bringing these together. Um, but uh, we have found that that space, the outdoor space and then the Briggs Opera House space is just continuing to evolve as a community arts um, destination where we're um, trying to raise awareness of it as an option where we're also using uh, live streaming um, in combination with live art events. And so that's another community engagement that we're really thinking about is how can we have a really flexible model. Um, we brought that format to our Juneteenth celebration in June here in Hartford where we had cameras at a live event that included speakers and music, but we were actually, you know, live streaming it to YouTube and then um, rebroadcasting it. So we're, you know, kind of trying to think about all these different layers and ways of engaging and thinking about accessibility because there were people who couldn't come to Juneteenth, um, sometimes seniors or, you know, different health conditions, et cetera. So we are just really wanting to maximize engagement through all the, all those means. 
That's excellent. I love it. Opening up all the accessibility and it's, it's amazing in some ways how many more people we can engage in that process. So great lessons learned. Thank you, Samantha. Annie, I'm going to go um, back to you. Hopefully your sound is working your better. Sound is working better. All right. All right. I'm getting feedback. I'm getting I don't know feedback. if everybody else is getting everybody feedback. Else is getting feedback. We are, but Kelly, if you we try, are, but Kelly, if you try and see answers, 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 when Annie answers, see if that Annie answers, see if that works. Not hearing you, Annie. Not hearing you, Annie. Looks like she's. Uh, Looks like she's. Uh, okay, I muted Annie so that we don't get feedback. It looks like she's typing something okay. in the chat, and she doesn't have access to audio settings. So we'll go ahead and switch yep. over to the next question you have, Kelly. Great. I'm going to ask Deborah. Deborah has her hand up. Deborah, if you'd like to ask your question of the panelist. Hi. Um, so my question actually was mostly for Annie, but um, I think maybe. Richard, Kelly, Will, and Samantha, you, you might also have experience with this. So I'm on, or I, I just resigned from the Economic Development Committee in Fairhaven. I'm also, I'm on the Planning Commission. I'm on a committee to um, build a new dog park in Fairhaven. And my husband and I founded the uh, Fairhaven Street Market that's on every Friday during the summer and early fall. So I'm really involved in trying to revitalize downtown Fairhaven. And um, I guess my question is, when, with any kind of initiative, you really need the support of the local government. And Fairhaven, in many ways, it's a, it's a depressed town. Like there are, I think at this point, there are five empty commercial spaces downtown. Um, I actually had a cafe that closed um, because of COVID. We just couldn't make a go of it. Um, but uh, with, say, with the dog park and with the, the Friday market, we've had enormous support from the community. People are excited to see something happening. Um, but because there are a lot of infrastructure needs, like we need new sidewalks, we need... Um, we're paying to um, rebuild the um, or to upgrade the, the uh, sewer processing plant. There are a lot of expensive, necessary projects going on in the town. Um, but to put a bit of life into the town, to make it feel like a place that people want to live and work and visit, um, you need these things that can from some perspective can seem frivolous. So I wanted to ask, like, I know Annie said, um, the cost for the park was really very big. And she said she worked to get the support of the, the government. Um, I know our select board has a hard time justifying expenses like advertising or promotion for things like um, so, so Deborah, are you you're you're getting at sort of how you prioritize the the different needs within within the community well, and like, so moving how, leadership? Yes, if you have um, projects that you want to do that are about space making that don't seem as vital as say brand new sidewalks or upgrading your sewage treatment plant, like yep, um, that's okay. How yeah, do you, no, do you get support from the yep. local for that kind of thing? when there are these other needs like yep absolutely i yeah that's a, and i think that that's a real challenge for many communities is some some of these other components around improving our public spaces are looked at or seen as um as just extras and not right. uh, not a necessity um any out of our panelists, anybody would like to take, like to respond to that very quickly? We've got about one more minute um, until we get into our small group discussions. Samantha? Um, I, I, those sound like a lot of challenges. I, I think I'm just popping in because may, maybe our model might offer something to you in the sense that, um, you know, I think that we were able to create um, 
envision using uh, our existing structures in a way that we're not super capital intensive um, to create some new rituals of gathering, um, just making a few strategic investments with, um, you know, our, our main cost infrastructure was we bought a projector and some sound equipment, but and some tables and chairs, but but it wasn't quite as capital intensive as as you know big infrastructure projects. Um, but it has a, a format that can be you know repeated, um, and it strikes me that um, that's that's the hardest but most important part that I think all of our projects are trying to do is to create the social uh, habits and rituals of gathering together in different spaces. Um, that's you know really where I think our sense of connection with place happens. Um, not that it's an either or, but when you're at that point where you maybe have some you know very serious uh, costs that the town is facing. And I, I, I mean, the, the argument for the arts not being frivolous, that's always a challenging one when, when people are worried about sewers functioning. And, um, you know, but on the other hand, I think, you know, have, have faith in your vision that um, it's really the arts that give me life meaning and give a sense of pride and identity. And that ultimately is what, you know, gives the, the beating heart to your community. Um, so yeah, I, 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 if, if certainly I'd be happy to talk with you if there's anything that we could do to support your efforts. Excellent, thank you, Samantha. And I will also just say, you know, incremental change is also important. So, you know, for those who joined at the beginning for the optional session, Richard Amore's presentation, he ended with, you know, dream big, think big, um, and take, and you can take small steps um, and testing and doing demonstration projects is a great way to bring your leadership along um, to make those types of investments, so. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to transition us to our breakout session uh, before we do that, I'm going to um, ask Rebecca to pull up the poll that we're going to do very quickly. Um, and we've got a couple of poll questions. Um, and our first question is, what do you see as the biggest opportunities for placemaking in your community? Um, this list is by no means complete. So if you want to add anything into the um, into the chat, then please do. And um, and then and then we're we're seeing people respond and we'll end the poll in just a minute where those opportunities are in your community. All right. Looks like Parks is taking the lead and public art is doing really well. We'll give folks just a couple more seconds to respond. All right. Why don't we go ahead and end that poll and we can share the results to that. All right. Is everybody seeing the results there? Okay, great. Yeah, so we see parks, public art is huge opportunities. Um, and I, I see here too, like vacant parking lots as well. Um, anything else that people want to throw out there in the chat would be great. Um, our next question is, what do you see the biggest obstacles to placemaking in your community? Um, and you can pick more than one as well. Um, we'll go ahead and put that, put the, put the next poll up. Where are the obstacles? Deborah was sharing her obstacle in Fairhaven that she has. Um, and if Rebecca, if you want to put up, can you? Are you able to put up the next poll? What I would suggest at this point is go ahead and put that answer in the chat. We're gonna do that because there we go. The polls. The is polls it working? Up. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. Just a few tech issues. Volunteer capacities. Yep resistance to community change, funding of your projects, insurance issues, technical assistance and skills that you need, overall time, and lack of support from leadership in your town. I didn't give folks a few, few seconds to respond and feel free to also add to this list by putting anything in the chat there. All right, we'll go ahead and end that poll. All right. See here, funding, volunteer capacity, definitely 
Insurance didn't come up. I like that that didn't come up. That used to be such a big issue around liability. So I like that people aren't seeing that become an issue anymore, but certainly uh, funding and lack of support from town officials. Okay, great. This is really helpful. Um, I also just want to remind folks to um, also share a picture with me. Um, you can send an email to me about your favorite place in your community. I've gotten a number of great pictures over the last few days and would love to share those um, tomorrow at tomorrow's workshop uh, when we reconvene. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and transition us into our breakout sessions. Ask me anything. These are, um, we've got our panel presenters joining us as our guest speakers. And then we've got uh, facilitators who are also issue experts as well, um, which will help keep the conversation going. The breakouts are really an opportunity to dig deeper on these topic issues. So we've got community engagement, making connections with groups in your community that traditionally have not been engaged. We've got our guest speaker, Samantha there, and facilitator Rebecca Simborn Stone from Community Workshop will be in that breakout. The second breakout will be enhancing accessibility, comfort, and appeal, identifying some of the key components to turn a public space into one that's inclusive. And our guest speaker will be Annie um, with facilitator Claire Tebbs from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Our third breakout will be creating a sense of place through arts and culture, utilizing visual arts and murals to reflect a shared vision and narrative that celebrates the collective voices within your community. We've got our guest speaker, Will, and um, facilitator Michelle Bailey from the Vermont Arts Council will be in um, breakout number three. And then if you're not finding any of those breakout sessions, places where you want to tackle some issues, I will be in an anything goes breakout room so we can talk about any topic that you're interested in um, with placemaking. You will have, once we open up the breakout rooms, you'll have the ability to uh, go in and out of the breakout rooms. So you can choose um, if you want to, if you want to stay in the same breakout room the entire time, that's great. And if you want to move around, that's wonderful. And then we will come back um, to the main room about 1155-ish. Um, all right, so we'll go ahead and open up the breakout rooms. And as you get into your breakout rooms, you can go ahead um, and if you need to do a quick uh, stretch break, and we will uh, start at 1117 in our breakout rooms.
Annie, are you, so are you in this main, this is Rebecca, are you in the main room now or are you, are you in your, well, you won't be answering me if you're in your breakout room, but. I'm not sure where I am. Okay, you're in the main room. So there's um, breakout rooms, one of which is yours. So um, if you scroll down, do you see a, a box? Yep, that I see Laura's inviting me. Okay, fabulous. Yay, it's working. And your audio sounds like it's working. For those of you who are still in this main room, I just want to rem remind you that you have the option to, <clears throat> with the breakout rooms box that's on your screen, you can scroll down and join any room that you want. And the really neat thing about this functionality now is that if you decide you want to spend some time in one breakout room and some time in another, you can move, you can jump rooms just like you would at a conference, a live conference.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us this morning. And thank you again to our panelists, to Annie and Will and Samantha and to our facilitators as well for facilitating and keeping us focused in our in our small group discussions. Thank you to Michelle and to Rebecca and to Claire. Really appreciate your organization. Um, and to obviously to all of you for participating and for being present today. Um, our breakout session um, got cut a little bit short and we were we were actually just ending on what is inspiring us right now. And so I would love to hear from everybody. Nicole um, from Linden brought this up. It was just what, what's inspiring you lately around placemaking. And um, so if you want to just quickly go in the chat and just share what's inspiring you, that would be fantastic. And I'm going to ask for our facilitators from Michelle and Rebecca and Claire to share very briefly just some maybe aha moments or some insights from your breakout sessions. And I'm going to start with Rebecca first. Great. Thanks, Kelly. So we were the community engagement breakout session with Samantha and had a really rich conversation. A lot of the challenges that came up and people are struggling with are exactly what you'd expect because we've all been struggling with them forever. Things like how do we find volunteers and how do we keep volunteers and keep them from getting burned out? And how do we reach new audiences and get the word out, especially to groups that may not hear through some of our typical channels? Um, um, but lots of great insight from Samantha and from folks on the call about some tried and true ways, some great lessons that we just need to remind ourselves again and some new techniques. So I think a couple highlights for me around volunteers, really thinking about how we serve them. What do they want to get involved with? Let's focus on their energy and activity and help them support and get involved in the things that they want to do. Um, focusing on making it a great experience for people, helping them feel like they're belonging to a community and celebrating their work and not just looking at them as a labor force, free labor force. Um, around getting the word out, lots of great conversation there too about really thinking about where we can connect with different audiences and groups and getting to know them, getting to know what works for them, how they want to engage, whether it's a school, reaching out and finding out who teaches what and how we can connect with their programs, um, sending newsletters out to the whole community. I think sometimes those old fashioned low, um, low tech strategies are still the best way to just blanket our communities and get news out. And I want to highlight just one theme that came up really right at the end, which is around prioritization. So we can admit that we're all short on time. Nobody has time to do engagement and communications exactly the way we'd like to or to reach as many groups as possible. Um, we do need to use layers. One technique is not going to work for everyone. So we're probably all forced to prioritize what channels we want to try and what groups we're going to work the hardest to reach. And just some suggestions at the end to think about what is most important. Um, maybe not trying to do more all the time, but focus on doing things better. And maybe it's time to not focus on reaching the most people, but focus on reaching people who may be left out and doing so in, in the places and ways that are comfortable for them. So, thanks. That's excellent, Rebecca. Thank you. I love that. We don't always have to be doing more, but just doing it better and staying focused. Excellent. Great. It sounds like you guys had a wonderful discussion. I'm going to next turn to Michelle. Sure. Um, so Will and I were part of the group that was uh, talking about creating a sense of place through arts and culture. And uh, a lot of folks had more questions for Will uh, about his work and working in communities. And I think the things that, that came out of this were uh, hearing a lot from Will about um, the variety of places that and opportunities where you can engage the community and and um, and voices from the community at different aspects of your project. So there's the whole design of the mural. What's it going to look like? What's the theme? What's the story you want to tell? And um, getting community engagement there. Then there's the community engagement around the making of the art. You know, we saw a lot of examples from Will around that. Um, and how students and folks were uh, working and doing their own work that would be integrated into the art. And then keeping in mind the activating of that space and kind of keeping it 
it um, relevant and um, a, a wonderful community resource, of course, all in the context of where the art is, but really keeping it um, as a place that can also draw new people and voices into that space. <clears throat> and I think the phrase, as you pointed out earlier, Kelly, um, why do the art if it isn't gonna be fun? That came through again, but I also loved, we ha did have one expression that Will used, which was, um, oh, where did I put my note? Um, see where the wind blows. And that point being just that you may come with a concept and um, or you may be coming and having the community develop the concept with you, but being flexible as the artist, as the community developers and planners, um, being flexible to creating those pieces and those spaces that really reflect that community. So that's that was uh, another uh, phrase that I think really struck me. That's excellent. Lots of pearls of wisdom from Will. I love it. <laughs> Being flexible is so key to all of this work. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm going to turn it over to Claire now. Hi, everyone. Um, we had a great, small, but mighty group uh, with Annie and myself. Annie um, was bringing her project Oak Ledge for All um, and speaking to increasing, improving accessibility and making everyone feel welcome and able to use a space. Um, some key takeaways that we had were that you, that less is more. Um, and if you start thinking about a space um, inclusively, that you don't need to like necessarily get um, this great ADA accessible uh, off the shelf piece uh, for a playground but start moving around the space, thinking about simple things that are often um, you know, quick and cheaper fixes like your surface, um, uh, dimensions of a space, how could a wheelchair move through the space, where can they sit and enjoy a meal with their family, um, is there a ramp up your steps? Um, so doing like short, uh, quick, easier fixes um, even if they're temporary while you go on to, you know, grander design ideas. Um, we also talked about just that the bar has been set really low. Obviously, you know, the amazing research that they did around the state and in New York, um, it's embarrassingly low. Um, and you would think we'd be way beyond where we are now um, as far as the cultural lens of designing spaces uh, for everyone, um, and um, you know, continuing to have these conversations at the local government level. That like, let's make this the norm that we're thinking about spaces for everybody, um, no matter their ability, and um, and putting yourself, you know, in the shoes of someone or in the wheels of someone um, that's using a wheelchair, um, and those who are loving people in weird wheelchairs. We ended with, um, you know, the inspiration of Annie's uh, twins and their voice and how much they love these spaces. And one of uh, Annie's biggest inspiration is seeing uh, her twins being finally able to swing together. Um, and just, you know, the, the message of that simple act of them being able to swing together is just mighty and very powerful. Uh, I think, let's see, I had one other thing. Um, don't leave this as a responsibility for these champions like Annie and volunteers in your community. Um, but it is really the responsibility of designers and planners to um, shift where they're beginning on this stuff. And uh, Oak Ledge for All is a great example of that, of Burlington really partnering and um, stepping it up and coming to the table and giving us a great example for our smaller towns to follow. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claire. I love that. Less is more. And also we can we can do a lot better around accessibility. Just also want to point out Michelle um, Bailey from Vermont Arts Council um, is also trained in ADA. So she's a wonderful resource when we're thinking about our public spaces. Um, and also too here at ARP, we're here to help support you in that effort as well, because it's such an important component to our public spaces. So 
Thank you all. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to our facilitators. Um, this was, I'm inspired and um, just feel really grateful to have such great participation today. We, this does conclude our programming for day one of our workshop, but we will be meeting back tomorrow uh, for day two at 9.30 for the optional session, which will be focused on different funding opportunities and technical assistance available. Um, and then we'll be showcasing um, 880s cities and ARPs winter placemaking guide. Uh, we'll have some more small group discussions and then uh, we'll have our final panelists uh, showcasing examples from Vermont communities as well. So look forward to seeing you all tomorrow um, and we'll be recording the workshop today and tomorrow. And if you haven't already, please send me a picture um, of your favorite place in your community because we'd love to uh, share it in our slideshow tomorrow. So thank you all. Thanks for being present. Thanks for contributing and being open to new ideas. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye.